Today I'm going to talk about a very very important topic that's diabetic emergencies. Diabetes is foremost the common disease the patients are going through. It has some uh, causative factors but it is the far most common disease ar- across the world. So it has some common and life threatening emergencies that you come across while working in emergency department. We'll talk about few common emergencies in the, related to diabetes. Let's go into the details. First, being an emergency physician, you have to realize and you have to you have to take notes of the red flags of any diseases apart from diabetic emergencies. Any disease that you come across, any presentation that you come across working in emergency department, you need to rule out the red flag signs. The red flag signs are the warning signs that can help you diagnose and adequately treat the patient and uh, protect the patient from causing death or any other major injuries. So, uh, for diabetic emergencies, while working in emergency department, first of all, good history is very, very essential. You need to realize that diabetic patients can present with variable symptoms. It can present with abdominal pain, chest pain, and many of the symptoms we'll talk about in detail. So first, talk, take a good history, but before that, it's really, really important to take care of three things while working in emergency department. First, airway. Is this patient breathing adequately? Second, breathing. Is the breathing adequate and symmetrical? And third is circulation. Are the organs being perfused or not? So, history. First, if the patient presents with chest pain, shoulder pain, dyspnea, these are very, very important and a lethal red flag sign, warning signs. So in diabetic patients, mainly patients present with atypical symptoms. They cannot mask, they cannot present with classical findings of any disease, most of the time. But if a patient comes with chest pain, shoulder pain and dyspnea, think of myocardial infarction or ischemia. At times, it is misdiagnosed. For example, if a patient comes to you with abdominal pain, diabetic patients are going through a neuropathy. They cannot appreciate the pain of the chest in myocardial infarction the way other people are, can appreciate who are not diabetic. So epigastric pain, patients elderly, diabetic epigastric pain, get an EKG first. Rule out any ischemic heart disease or any changes in EKG. Simple test can give you a lot of information. Fever. Diabetic patients are prone to infections because of the immunocompromised state. The mild immunocompromised state that is caused by diabetes can cause recurrent infections. But in emergencies, fever is not the, the thing to be uh, taken care of. The most important thing is infection or sepsis. Diabetic patients are very prone to infection, as I said before. So the chances of sepsis and septic shock is way higher in patients who are not diabetic. And sepsis itself is life-threatening. But what's causing it? Diabetes. No history of medication, mismanagement or non-compliance. Many patients around the de- in the developing countries they, are, they have not developed medical facilities or they are not well educated for the control of diabetes. They are not dietary compliance, they are not taking medications adequately, they are not monitoring their blood pressures adequately and they are not following up with endocrinologists as much as they need. So with no history of medication and non-compliance, organic precipitin high and hyper and hyper or hyper and hypoosmolic hypoglycemic state hyperglycemic and hypoglycemic are most importantly due to compliance moving on patients medications administered by someone else caregiver abuse or neglect at times it is fatal it is to be taken seriously Oral hypoglycemic use, prolonged severe, severe hypoglycemia, 
Why is oral hypoglycemic use is at times fatal? Because the half-life of the most of the oral hypoglycemic states take hours. For example, 12 hours. So the patient will remain in hypoglycemic state if not treated adequately for 12 hours at least. So these patients are prone to become neuro, uh, neurological deficit because of prolonged hypoglycemic state, recurrent infections, diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state, previously known as hyperosmolar non-ketotic uh, non -keto non hyperglycemia. These patients should be monitored for at least ample amount of time so that the effect of the oral hypoglycemics is waved off and the patient is stable to go home. Dark vomit or stool, GI bleed. Patients with diabetes are prone to have GI bleed. Rupture ulcer, ischemia, perforated ulcerations can lead to uh, GI bleed. Melina and hematomasis. Apart from hepatic liver diseases, most commonly DCLD, that's decompensated liver diseases, uh, due to hepatitis C or B or liver cirrhosis or alcoholic liver diseases, patients with diabetes can present with melina and hemat hematomasis. Why? Because melina is, occult, is blood in the stool. Patients with mesenteric ischemia can present with occult blood or, or melina. And, these pa and with diabetes, mesenteric ischemia is a worse complication of diabetes. So GI bleed again. History of renal diseases. Renal diseases, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic nephropathy is also a complication of diabetes and at times can present with renal insufficiency. And diabetic patients should be evaluated for renal diseases. But at times, the patients who are on oral hyperglycemics and have deranged or compromised renal functions, they are prone to have increased insulin levels. Why? Because the excretion of insulin is with uh, with renal uh, with renal systems but if renal system is adequate is not working properly the insulin concentration in increases inside the body and hence can produce state of hyperglycemia and prolonged hyperglycemia so possible fluid overload can be an outcome possible need for dialysis or intubation history of depression or suicidal suicidal uh, suicidal attempts intentional insulin can present with hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a very, very important and very, very diagnostic feature of a patient who is coming with altered mental status. If a patient come, comes to you with altered mental status or coma, first and the foremost thing, get blood, get blood sugar levels. And with adequate treatment of blood sugar's level, the patients can regain, regain consciousness and can be sent home if treated appropriately. So continuing again, examination findings. If you find a focal neurological findings, that's a focal neurological deficit. Diabetes itself can cause many complications, includes heart diseases, CVA, that's cerebrovascular accidents, renal diseases, pulmonary diseases, recurrent infections. So if a patient comes to you with prolonged diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, and has a, neuro and a focal neurological deficits or findings, Think of CVA and hypoglycemia. Why is hypoglycemia? Because prolonged hypoglycemia cause cerebral vascular deprivation and hence cause neurological deficit. Hypoxia, diffuse rails, fluid overload, ARDS. Patients with renal insufficiency due to diabetes can present with fluid overload. Patients with myocardial infarction, myocardial infarction due to diabetes and other risk factors can present with diffuse crepitations in the chest. Acute respiratory distress syndrome can be a presentation with diabetes. Poor hygiene, non-ambulatory and poor vision. Poor hygiene is, can cause recurrent infections in a, human, in a human body. Diabetic patients who are already prone to recurrent diseases and a poor hy hygiene can put on an add-on worse effect on the patients for infection and septicemia. Patients who are bed-bound, patients who are not ambulatory, 
they can present where well, they can have a very worse outcome with diabetes. They can present with hypoglycemia. They can patients with hyperglycemia or diabetes, known case of uh, known, known case of diabetes, and prolonged bed ban or bed sores can can be a source of infection and can present with worse outcomes. Poor vision, diabetic retinopathy is a complication of diabetes. So inability to access or administer medications. Skin ulcers, potential infectious etiology of DKA and hyperglycemic hyperosmotic state. Why is skin ulcers a very, very prone, a very, very important thing to, to notice in a patient with diabetes? Skin ulcers, especially the patients with di prolonged diabetes or diabetic foot, these patients are prone to get injured because they are because of necrosis, because of irreversible changes, because of and because of vascular uh, problems due to diabetes, due to neuropathy, these patients can present with uh, infections. Skin is the most common one. They are prone to get recurrent infections via skin and hence can, in, can exacerbate diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. So hypo and hyperthermia, infection, meningitis and sepsis. Diabetic patients can present again, I repeat again, diabetic patients are prone to get in, to get recurrent infections. They're grown, they're prone to get any type of, uh, any type of lethal infections. For example, infections of diabetic foot, the mesenteric ischemia, sepsis, meningitis, cause small respirations and fruity breath, signs of diabetic ketoacidosis. Well, to explain more in details, later on in the subsequent slide. Focal abdominal pain and peritonitis, surgical cause of DKA and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Perineal erythema, inflammation and swelling, again, signs of infection. Diabetic patients prone to get infected. Forneous gangrene and necrotizing fasciitis is an example of complications of patients with diabetes. So moving on to diabetic ketoacidosis, it is a life-threatening emergency. How do a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis present? Patient known case of diabetes or newly diagnosed diabetic, more commonly in the patients with type 1 diabetes, but can happen in patients with type 2 diabetes, it is a life-threatening emergency. What are the most common presentation symptoms for the patients with diabetic ketoacidosis? Polyuria, abdominal pain, polydipsia, cause small respirations, altered mental status. What are the baseline investigations for diabetic ketoacidosis? Acidosis, check for A9 gap, bicarbonate less than 15, and positive blood ketones, and sugars, blood sugars more than 250. But before going on, what is diabetic ketoacidosis? I will explain the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. So it is a relative or absolute insulin deficiency. What happens is when there is a relative insulin or, or absolute insulin deficiency, the pancreas cannot able to secrete insulin. There is decreased utilization of glucose inside the body and the by, by, the, by the body cells. What happens then? There is state of starvation inside the body. So then the counter-regulatory hormones are activated. For example, catecholamines, growth hormones. They increase gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, which causes <clears throat> increased blood sugars. So muscle cells increase breakdown of the amino acids and other substrates leads to glycogen chain. Fat cells, which causes glycerol. What happens is, Fat cells, when the, re the release of fatty acids due to starvation, fat cells are, uh, are broken down into fatty acids. Fatty acids that don't go into the Krebs cycle can lead into ketones, production of ketones. Fatty acids converted to ketones, increased glucagon, produce, uh, increased glucagon can increase uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And again, yet the outcome of all this feedback is glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and ketogenesis. Again, why is this happening? Because of 
lack of insulin inside the body. Lack of insulin causes counter-regulatory hormone productions, which secretes uh, catecholamines, glucagon, and growth hormones, which give the negative uh, feedback and increase the glucose pr uh, productions by these mechanisms I've explained before. Moving on, in, in increased ketone productions, increased ketones in the body. So the ketone, the fruity smell, the patients you can experience in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis is due to ketones. And acidosis is due to the fatty acids which are converted into the ketones. So history. Ask the patient if there is a signs of diabetic ketosis. For example, ask for increased urination or painful urination. Why painful urination? Infections. Think of increased thirst, polyphagia, any altered mental status, any recent infections, because recent because infections are most common cause of diabetic ketoacidosis and can exacerbate diabetic ketoacidosis. So history is very, very important if a patient comes to you and you are suspecting a diabetic ketoacidosis. Re rule out any recurrent infections because that infection needs to be treated while treating the diabetic ketoacidosis. Have you had any nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pain? Missed your insulin doses. It is very, very important and very, very most very common cause of diabetic ketoacidosis in patients, especially in the developing world. Why is this so? Because of lack of education because of lack of education about the complications and the way of treating that complication. Lack of adequate medical facilities and tertiary care and non-compliance to medications are foremost the most important cause of patients presenting in emergency with diabetic ketoacidosis. So any changes in diet? Have you had any chest pain or dog stool? Look for MI. Look for MI because MI is life-threatening. Dog stools, look for melina. Ask for GI bleed, fever, painful urination, and shortness of breath. Fever uh, can give you a hint of infection. Painful urination, urinary tract infections, and shortness of breath. Complications of deranged renal function tests or myocardial ischemia. Have you been following your usual insulin uh, schedule recently? As I mentioned before, if a patient missed or is not taking insulin adequately and timely, can present with diabetic ketoacidosis. So, what will happen in physical examination? As an emergency uh, physician, you need to realize and rely on physical examination before even the labs turn out for any diagnosis. Physical examination is very, very important. In diabetic ketoacidosis, what happens is there is dehydration, swear dehydration, because of, of the increased, uh, because of the glucose excreting through the uh, renal system can cause increased water excretion. So what happens is patients with diabetic ketoacidosis are tachycardic. What does that imply? Dehydration. Fluid deficit increase. You, the patient will look to toxic. There will be increased skin turgor. There will be signs of sweat dehydration. Lethargic, weakness, tachycardia, hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension. Changes in blood pressure. Hyperthermia, decreased temperature. Acidemic. Why is acidemic? Because of the ketones produced by the fatty acid uh, modifications in, pa in patients with uh, decreased insulin or lack of insulin. So tab fatty acids are converted into ketones which produce the state of acidemia. Cause small respirations. Systemic ketosis. The, the uh, effect of ketones, pr production of ketones can affect many organs. For example, brain, heart diseases, abdominal pain, renal function tests, urine, Ketones can have a variety of symptoms. Changes in mental status or coma, altered mental status, 
infections, in, uh, recurrent infections, and the patients with diabetic ketoacidosis are also prone to get infected. So at times, a patient might present to you with signs of DKA with the history of previous infection. So it is very, very important. After non-compliance of medication, infection is the most important cause for diabetic ketoacidosis. So managing management of diabetic ketoacidosis. It is very, very important. Because why working as an emergency physician, you need to realize what are the outcomes of the complications of diabetic ketoacidosis. First is dehydration. The therapy of diabetic ket ketoacidosis is fluid resuscitation. It is by far the most important thing to do in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. It is said that in diabetic ketoacidosis or diabetic emergencies, there is around a six to 10 liters of fluid deficit. So that needs to be resuscitated adequately and timely. So what is the diagnostic criteria of diabetic ketoacidosis? Blood sugar levels of 250, more than 250. Arterial pH of 7.3, that's due to, that's acidosis due to ketones. Serum bicarbonate levels less than 15, signifies metabolic acidosis. And moderate ketonuria and ketonemia. Apart from all this, you need to get electrolyte levels before treating the patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. And you have to look for potassium. That's by far the most important thing in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. You can check for serum osmolality. That's more widely used in the patients with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. And A9 gap in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. It can, and can help, you, uh, help you for the prognosis and the uh, modifications with the treatment that the patient is getting by, uh, uh, by, uh, in the patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. So in DKA, the prime uh, therapy, therapy is IV fluids, insulin, and deal with potassium. IV fluids, by far, as I mentioned before, is the treatment of choice in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis because of severe dehydration. So, before going on, insulin is, in two, is given two, in, in two ways, subcutaneous or IV. But due to dehydration, it is not recommended to the patient to give a subcutaneous because the effect would be delayed. It's better to give patients IV insulin boluses first initially and then regular well infusion at a significant amount of rate per kg for significant decrease in blood sugar levels. Potassium on the, on the other hand, acidosis causes potassium to come out of the cell causing hyperkalemia, but inside the cell, this is hypokalemia. So if a, patient, if a patient comes to you with diabetic ketoacidosis, check for potassium, because if potassium is already low, insulin might cause decrease in uh, uh, potassium because of increased shift of potassium in, into the cell, can cause fatal arrhythmias and fatal outcomes. So potassium needs to be regulated and needs to be treated and be controlled in a certain amount of range in diabetic ketoacidosis. So determine hydration status. How do you determine? Skin turgor, hypotension, tachycardia, lethargy, coating of the tongue, sunken fr uh, uh, frontenails, decreased capillary refill. These, can, these are all signs of severe dehydration. Hypovolemic shock, the patients present with hypovolemic shock, mild hypertension, cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock, why? Because patients with diabetes are prone to get ischemic heart disease. When ischemic heart disease, especially with anterior wall MI or anterior wall metacardial infarction, there is increased amount of systolic dysfunction. With increased systolic dysfunction, there is fluid overload or fluid pulling back into the lungs causing leading into cardiogenic shock. So the first-hand treatment in patients with hypovolemia, 
0.9% normal cell line it should be resuscitated as rapidly as the doctors can, nursing staff can. Why? Because the mainstay of treatment is fluid resuscitation. It is said to have a large bore 18 gauge cannula for administration of fluids. 1 to 1.5 liter should be given in first hour. Evaluate correctly sodium levels. Why is this so? Because sodium itself can decrease because of excessive diuresis. So if a patient with hyper or hyponatremia, there is a variety of fluid resuscitation that has to be chosen by an emergency physician if sodium levels are need to be corrected. Serum sodium level high, use 0.45% normal saline. Uh, serum uh, sodium levels are normal, use 0.445% of normal saline. Normal or high normal should be given 0.45% of normal saline. Patients with hyponatremia, low sodium should be given 0.9% of normal saline. So, when glucose reaches 250 milligram per deciliter, you have given adequate resuscitation to the patient. This patient should be given now a, a continuous fluid on a maintenance dose. So when a blood sugar level is less than 250, change the fluid from, five, from normal saline to 5% dextrose with adequate insulin and should be given at 100 to 200 ml per hour. Check for blood sugars, CAM7, that's electrolytes, every two to four hours until the patient is stable. So as I mentioned before, Insulin can be given subcutaneous IM or IV route, but IV route is recommended in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis because you have to set a target that the 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter or per milligram or per, or per deciliter of sugars should be decreased in the first one hour of the patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. If not, the patient should be given IV boluses of insulin to get to the target value. So regular insulin should be given at 0.515 unit per kg if an IV and in subcutaneous 0.3 unit per kg. And for infusions, with continuous infusions, the patient should be given 0.1 unit per kg per hour and for subcutaneous or IM route should be given 0.1 unit per kg per hour. So if blood uh, glucose level does not fall by 50 to 70 milligram of, deci uh, of deciliter in first one hour, this patient needs extra insulin. This patient needs double the insulin infusions hourly. Give hourly IV 10 units of insulin bolus until unless you reach your target value. So again, when the blood sugars are more or less than 250, Change, this, uh, change the fluid from, 5 from normal saline to 5% dextrose with adequate insulin. And check for electrolytes every two to four hours. So again, in, with potassium and in, with acidosis, acidosis cause increased potassium out of the cell, causing the hyperkalemic state, but hypokalemic state inside the cell. But if the patient is already hyperkalemic or a borderline uh, potassium levels, for example, a potassium levels are less than 3.3, .3, do not give insulin. Why? Because it, it can cause increased hypokalemia. Because insulin shifts potassium from outside to inside. So what to do? Give 40 MEQs of, pot of potassium chloride every two hours until potassium levels increases by 3.3. If serum potassium is more than 5.5, do not give anything. Check potassium levels every two hours. Go for insulin because it can help you decrease the potassium as well. If serum 
potassium is less than 3.3, but more than 5.5, give 20, MEQ, 20 to 30 MEQs of potassium and each liter of IV fluids. This is the mainstay of treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. Along with it, if the patient is with severe acidosis, for example, of pH of 6.9, you need to replace bicarbonate. It is not recommended solely for diabetic ketoacidosis, but at times can present with severe acidosis and needs treatment. And very, very important thing, what's the causing this patient diabetic ketoacidosis? Is this infection? Need to be treated. Give IV antibiotics, treat the cause. If it's non-compliance, education is very, very important. Educate the patient for insulin therapy. So some special patients, for example, pediatric patients. Pediatric patients are more prone to get infections because of low immune state. And diabetic uh, and type, type, type 1 diabetes is also common in younger children and young, younger patients. So there should be dose amplification of the patient of uh, small children for insulin. And diabetic ketoacidosis should be treated adequately. Pregnant patients, they can present with hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Gestational diabetes can present with increased bl blood sugar levels. That needs to be treated adequately. Patients with congestive heart failure, again, why? Because of increased risk of acute myocardial and infarction. That needs to be treated. Patients with renal failure and diabetic ketoacidosis. Renal failure, because of diabetic neuropathy, can cause various symptoms. For example, fluid overload. As I mentioned at the start of this beginning of this lecture, renal insufficiency increases the half-life of insulin, which causes increased state of hyperglycemia or increased risk of state of hyperglycemia inside the body. With, with, that, without, with renal insufficiency, diabetic ketoacidosis cannot be treated adequately because of why? Because of bicarbonates that has something to do with renal system. The urinary output, are these patients getting adequate fluid? That how, can, how could it be checked by adequate urinary output? So these, this needs a careful administration of and treatment of patients with diabetic ketosis and diabetes if they present with renal insufficiency. So what are the complications? Cerebral edema. Cerebral edema is due to rapidly decreasing serum osmolality. This can cause cerebral edema. Massive amount of insulin infusion can cause cerebral edema. So diabetic ketoacidosis itself, it's a very, very uh, life-threatening emergency but you have to be uh, you have to be sure and you have to be, give treatment in certain ranges that the patient cannot further deteriorate and can cause and any other problem to the patient adult respiratory distress syndrome pulmonary edema with acute myocardial infarctions hypoglycemia as I mentioned before I will explain more on hyperglycemia in the subsequent uh, slides. Hyperglycemia is by far due to insulin except because of increased use of insulin. It's a very, very common cause of patients presenting with hyperglycemia. So moving on to hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is more common in patients with type 2 diabetes. What is the difference between diabetic ketoacidosis and patients with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state? Because lack of acidosis. With lack of acidosis, patients won't be having enough ketones. Next, the blood sugar levels are high, more than 600. Serum osmolality is increased, more than 320 to 340. So that, that, need, that needs treatment, that needs adequate treatment. 
the treatment for hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state and diabetic ticket acidosis is somewhat dissimilar. But before going to the treatment, first the pathophysiology. So, insulin deficiency. In patients with type 2 diabetes, there is production of insulin, but there is increased resistance to insulin. That causes increased uh, insulin uh, resistance, which causes incre increased blood sugar levels. Decreased glucose utilization. Again, the same mechanism. Counter regulatory hormones are produced. Increased lipolysis, increased proteolysis, decreased bre increased breakdown of the amino acids and hence increased glucogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenic substrates are produced because of, of the increased breakdown of fatty acids and lipolysis and proteolysis. Increased gluconeogenesis, which all of this can cause hyperglycemia and hence glycosuria. With glycosuria, there is increased water loss leading to dehydration. So this is the mechanism that is causing severe dehydration in the patients with diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, leading to dehydration. Impaired renal functions because of pre-renal azotemia or renal azotemia, decreased fluid intake and hyperosmolality. Hyperosmolality is calculated with electrolytes. We'll explain further. The normal or it's hyper, uh, the, the, the normal serum osmolality is 286 to 290, but more than 320 with high blood sugar levels and lack of ketones, it's hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state. So again, history. Patients present with non-specific complaints. Abdominal pain, diarrhea, decreased urine output, chest pain. Weakness, lethargy, fatigue because of dehydration, polyuria, increased urination because of glycosuria. Glu uh, glucose itself can cause water to be excreted. Polydipsia, increased thirst. Recurrent infections, prone to recurrent infections. Acute myocardial infarctions. Again, patients with diabetes can most of the time do not present were typical, uh, typical symptoms of myocardial infarction. They can present with atypical presentation. For example, they can present with abdominal pain. So a patient with abdominal pain, high risk factor, get an EKG. Why? Because this is a simple test, won't take much of your time, but can help you rule out the life-threatening diseases. Stroke, cerebrovascular accidents, more prone because of diabetes. GI bleed, as I mentioned before, more can be uh, can be due to diabetes. So, patients with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state or increased blood sugar levels are prone to get satellitis, infections over the skin, melina, increased blood in the stool, volume depletion. How do you assess volume depletions? Tachycardia, hypertension. Skin turgor, tongue coated, tongue co white tongue coated, lethargy, weakness, tachycardia, these all are signs of volume depletion. Cognitive impairment, high blood sugar levels, or CVA can cause stroke or signs of cerebral edema, altered mental status, lethargy and coma. And at times, with the patients with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state can present with diabetic neuropathy or patients can present with acute kidney injury. So at times they can present with decreased urinary output. Although patients can have loose stools, diarrhea or constipation, gastroparesis. So that needs to be treated adequately. So what are the diagnostic testing? Serum osmolality. How do you assess serum osmolality? Serum osmolality is measured by 2 into sodium plus glucose over 18 plus blood urea nitrogen divided by 2.8. This is the formula for 
seromorphic malality. So seromorphic malality in the patients with hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state is more than 2, 320 to 2, 340. But it is said the patients with hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state, seromorphic malality should not be decreased less than 0 0.3 per hour because uh, more than 0 0.3 per hour because it can cause cerebral edema. ECG, a very, very important test. Again, won't take much of your time, give you a lot of information. Blood cultures, if you're, if you're suspecting uh, sepsis, recurrent infections, cellulitis. Diabetic patients, as I mentioned before, are prone to get infections. So these patients need blood cultures. Cardiac enzymes, rule out any cardiac uh, ischemia. CKMB and, card and troponins. Troponins are way far the most sensitive and most reliable test. Chest X-ray, fluid overload, any uh, respiratory tract infections, any signs of acute respiratory distress syndrome. CT scan, in elderly patients to be precise, and the patients with altered mental status. Lumbar puncture, meningitis, why? Because of recurrent infections in patients with diabetes. ABGs, look for blood, blood gases. Hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state is not acido acidosis as compared with diabetic ketoacidosis that is acidosis. So pH is most of the time within normal range of the patient with the hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state until or unless they swear problems with renal function tests or any other system involved. So how do you patient, how do you manage it? How do you manage the patients with hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state? Again, it is the treatment for both DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state is dependent on fluid resuscitation. Fluid resuscitation is very, very important. The mainstay of treatment in patients in diabetic emergencies is fluid. So give one, point, one to 1.5 liter of normal saline initially, IV fluids determine hydration status, hypovolemic shock, exp uh, plasma expander, mild hypertension, hyperhemodynamic monitoring, evaluate corrected sodium, serum sodium levels, high give 0.5 4.5%, High and normal gives 0.45% of normal saline. If serum sodium is low, go for 0.9%. Normal saline at 4 to, uh, 4 to 14 uh, ml per kg per hour, depending on the state of hydration. Normal saline, again, the same rate with serum sodium is low. Insulin with 0.1 unit per kg per hour IV infusions. Check for serum glucose. If it doesn't fall by 50 mg per DL in first four hours, double the dose and until it falls at 50 to 70 mg per deciliter. Target value is, is serum glucose is 300 mg. Change to dextrose, 5% dextrose. And decrease insulin to 0 0.05 unit per kg to maintain serum glucose between 250 to 300 until the plasma osmolarity is less than 315. Check electrolytes burn creatinine and glucose every two to four hours. If patient is NPO, continue IV insulin. Supplement with subcutaneous regular insulin as needed. Potassium again, as I mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the, in the portion of diabetic ketoacidosis, potassium is 3.3, do not give insulin, otherwise replace potassium. If potassium is more than five, do not give potassium replacement, continue insulin. If serum potassium is more than 3.3, but less than five milliequivalents, give 20 to 30 milliequivalents in each liter of IV fluids. So now, again, a very high yield topic and a very high yield thing to notice in a patient presenting in the emergency department, that's hypoglycemia. When do you call hypoglycemia when blood sugar levels are less than 50? And when do you call severe hypoglycemia and the blood sugar level is less than 30? Before going into pathophysiology, let me remind you a few things.
If a patient comes to you on ED with altered mental status, first thing to do, blood sugar levels. What is the most important cause of hyperglycemia? Exogenous insulin. Why so? Because of non-compliance and unawareness of how to deal with insulin. The patient can present to you with the patient who had already taken oral hypoglycemics, prolonged or long acting oral hypoglycemics. They can present with prolonged effect of hypoglycemia. What is the out worst outcome of hypoglycemia? Patient can go into coma because of injuries into the cerebral into the in, in the brain due to hypoglycemia. That is hypoglycemic brain injury. So, absolute insulin deficiency in patients with type 1 diabetes, imperfect insulin replacement, hypoglycemia. Type 1 diabetes, no increase in glucagon, hypoglycemia. No, dec uh, no decrease in insulin, hypoglycemia. Reduced autonomic responses. That is epinephrine, decreased epinephrine, defective glucose counter-regulation, hence hypoglycemia. Decreased symptoms, hypoglycemia and awareness, and hypoglycemia. These all are the causes of hypoglycemia, but the far most the common, but by far the most common cause is exogenous insulin. Due to unawareness, poor compliance, and not keeping up with the endocrinologist for insulin management. Recurrent infections can cause hypoglycemia. Pancreatic B cell tumors can cause hypoglycemia because of exogenous production of insulin. Renal insufficiency can cause hypoglycemia because of decreased renal excretion. So these all are causes of hypoglycemia. Before Going on to the what might be the cause of the patient uh, hypoglycemia, you need to treat the patient with hypoglycemia. Even if you don't know anything about this patient, treat hypoglycemia first, because the, the longer you take time to replace the blood sugars, the more prone to get cerebral hypoxia and cerebral injuries. So hospital emergency room patient with hypoglycemia, blood glucose less than 70, but it is said if it's severe hypoglycemia, if it's less than 30. Treat according to severity if fresh diseases. Evaluate for cause in all patients and treat the cause. If the patient is able to eat, give three gram of oral glucose. If the patient is not able to treat, give IV 50% of dextrose. And then 10% of dextrose fluid IV at 100 ml per hour until the patient is stabilized. Look for the cause. Is this caused by exogenous insulin? Look for any pancreatic tumor, history of pancreatic tumors. Look for any necrotizing pancreatitis, any oral hypoglycemics, long acting oral hypoglycemics that are taken, that are taken intentionally or not, uh, unintentionally. That needs to be taken care of for a longer period of time because these patients with prolonged oral hypoglycemics are prone to get re recurrent hypoglycemia. So what can be given to the patient who can eat? Fruit juice, sliced bread, cup of milk and two to three biscuits can help maintain blood sugar levels. But patients who cannot eat can be given injection glucagon but most of the times dextrose can be can provide adequate amount of blood sugars. Monitor blood glucose every 30 minutes until the, uh, it is more than 100 milligram per deciliter. Once gluco blood glucose is more, uh, more than 100, evaluate for the cause, change in any medication, diet or activity, and decide if further monitoring is required or not. It is said in the patients with long-acting hypoglycemics, for example, long-acting insulin, and long acting or in hyperglycemics, these patient needs in hospital uh, treatment or in hospital monitoring. These patients should be admitted and should be monitored. 
Thank you. So in this lecture, I talked about diabetic emergencies, which includes diabetic idiosidosis, hyperglycemic hyperosmotor state, and hypoglycemia. Diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmotor hypoglycemic state are life-threatening emergencies. These, can ca these cause severe amount of dehydration and hence can, can cause decreased organ perfusion and lead to hypovolemic shock. How to treat that? The mainstay of treatment is fluid replacement. Next, I talked about hypoglycemia. What is the cause of hypoglycemia? What should be done if a patient presents to you with altered mental status? What should be taken care of if the patient presents with hypoglycemia? How to manage, whom to admit, and whom can we send home? Thank you for watching.